I think there has to be no greater grief than for a parent to lose a child to death. And as a pastor, I've often heard grief-stricken parents say to me, Justin, a parent shouldn't have to bury their child. And in today's passage of scripture, we're gonna meet a man, it's a grief-stricken father whose daughter has died. And we're gonna journey with him and we're gonna see something of ourselves in this story. And I want you to turn to Mark chapter five and verse 21. It's on page 37 in the New Testament. Mark chapter five and verse 21. As we continue on in our series, People Jesus Met. Page 37, and I'm gonna come and we'll read in a moment, we'll read the verses as we make our way through the sermon this morning. So as you turn to Mark 5, 21, uh, this account is one of only three accounts we have in the New Testament of Jesus raising somebody to life, and I believe that this account, like the others, demands a response because it's a stumbling block for many. You may have come here this morning and you might say, uh, science says death is the end, there's nothing after death. Science says miracles don't happen. But the question I have is how will you respond this morning? What are you gonna do in the light of this? Is Jesus who he says he is? Who do you say Jesus is? Is he the son of God? Is he God come in the flesh? Does he have power even over death? Well the backstory here is that Jesus arrives in Capernaum He's come across the Sea of Galilee. He's been on the other side. Uh, If you look back in the chapter, you'll see he's calmed the storm uh, and then he's healed this demon-possessed man. And it's amazing how word has already spread. And so by the time Jesus lands on the shore back in Capernaum, there's this crowd that's gathered. So let's pick up the story, Mark chapter five and verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. So Jairus is this leader of the synagogue and he sees this crowd, he has some kind of intensity or desperation to get to Jesus. He presses through the crowd, he manages to make it to Jesus and then all of a sudden he falls to to his knees at the feet of Jesus. And I can imagine the shock of the other religious leaders, some of his colleagues who are there who who have responsibility for services in the synagogue in Capernaum, and they're looking and they're saying, what is Jairus doing? Why is he down on his knees? Doesn't he know who this man is? This is a demon-possessed instigator, troublemaker. He calls himself a healer. Doesn't he know who this Jesus is? But Jairus, this prominent religious leader, has not come to Jesus to accuse him, but he's come to fall at his feet to ask for help. And he pleads with him, he pleads earnestly. Look at verse 23, he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. Nothing is worse. Nothing is worse than watching a little child die. And I'm a dad of two daughters and as I think about what it must have been like for Jairus, to watch his child die and then leave her there and and race for the only help he could find. I think back on the funerals of all the children as I prepared, the the funerals that I've conducted and families that I've met with and my heart still grieves and they still grieve. Someone came up this morning who I know really well and said it's been two and a half years and I I don't think the pain goes away. I don't think it ever will and I I don't think it should because you can't love to that degree if you don't also feel loss to that degree. And I think of little Peyton, seven months old. At six months she was fine, she was all bubbly and cute. And by seven months she'd passed away in that month of leukemia and shock for the parents and journeying with them at the hospital and saying, well let's conduct a little dedication service and just committing her to the Lord and just watching her just fade away. It broke my heart. And to conduct that funeral and to recognize that even a little seven month old has impacted so many lives, which reminded me it doesn't matter how long you've lived for, the value of a life is important to God and every life is worth saving. But Jairus' daughter is 12 years old. In fact, Luke goes further and he tells us that she's an only child. She's Jairus' only daughter. You can imagine how his world's beginning to collapse and you can hear the affection in his voice, my little daughter. My little girl, my little girl is at the point of death. Jesus, she's dying. And maybe Jairus thought to himself, she's not gonna even live into the teen years. 
I'm not going to get to walk her down the aisle. She's not going to have a special wedding day, and, and my mom and I, her mom and I, aren't going to be there to witness this, this special day unless you come, Jesus, unless you touch her and heal her. And I was thinking, how many people? who would ordinarily never come to Christ, how many people who would ordinarily never bow the knee to Christ will come in a time of crisis? Because that's Jairus' story. Here he is. For all intents and purposes, he shouldn't have come. He's part of that religious establishment that will eventually put Christ to death. But here he is on his knees. It's a crisis. He's got nowhere else to turn. And I think death is a great leveler. It's a great leveler. It doesn't matter if you're rich doesn't matter if you're poor. When you become ill, when impending death is there, we're all on the same level. It doesn't matter who you are. Are we going to meet a lady in this story, uh, this woman, and she, for all intents and purposes, is poor, and we've got Jairus, who, for all intents and purposes, is probably rich. He's got influence. Both of them are desperate when they come to Jesus, and they're on this flat level before death. Just moments before Robert Elton Harris was executed in the gas chamber, I think it was back in 1992 in California, after a string of crimes, he said something quite profound. As they led him into that gas chamber, as he was about to meet his fate, this is what he said. You can be a king or a street sweeper, but everybody dances with the grim reaper. You can be a king. You can be a street sweeper, but everybody dances with the grim reaper. And that's what death does. It brings all of us to our knees, even Jairus. I don't know about you, but the times when my mortality has stared me in the face. When I was 27 years old and a a driver went into my door at 90 kilometers per hour and hit me square in the face, I stared death in the face. And that 10-month recovery of ICU, I stared death in the face. And I thought, God, I'm a pastor. I'm still young. I'm immune from death. I'll think about that in the future. When faced with that, it probably was the second greatest turning point in my life, second to my conversion. My ministry changed from that day onwards. I stopped playing games and I got serious and I, I recognized God's call on my life. That's what illness does. That's what crisis does. It forces us to face reality, to think about spiritual things. And maybe you're here this morning and you've just casually waltzed in and you, you think you've got your whole life ahead of you. And God says in this passage, you don't. You don't know how long that is. I've numbered your days. Where do you stand with me? The great C.S. Lewis was only married for a mere four years. And his wife, Joy, passed away from cancer. And he wrote in his book, The Problem of Pain, he wrote this, pain insists upon being attended to. If you've got pain in your life, if you've got a sore arm or a throb in your toe, it's shouting at you, it's demanding attention, you can't switch off, you can't focus on work, you can't watch Netflix, you can't sleep, it's there all the time, it's shouting, it's nagging, it's got to be attended to. And Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. And so when we face pain, perhaps God in those moments wants to use that as a megaphone to say, I wanna get your attention. I want you to look to me. And so what a relief Jairus must have felt when he comes to Jesus and Jesus agrees to go with him. That's verse 24. He didn't know if Christ would be willing to come. I'm bothering this superhero, this superstar. Is he gonna actually be willing to go with me? Well, Jesus is. Because Jesus is not a superstar as our superstars are. He's the humble servant. So look at verse 24. No sooner have they hit the road on the way to Jairus' house and they gridlocked in major traffic. Know how that feels? Verse 24, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. I read traffic. And Luke goes even further and says, the crowds almost crushed him. Just imagine there's this throng, it's like a, a you know, mad soccer supporters in the UK. I mean, we know how they are. I mean, just pressing in, there's just this crowd and they've, they've been crushed. And now there's this perhaps irritation, there's this delay. I mean, if Jairus had the Waze app, I mean, the app would have gone psycho with all those like icons of like hazards and all the roads turned red and he's thinking, are we ever gonna get there? Because Jairus wasn't just late for a meeting, his daughter was hanging between life and death. I remember when Summer, our youngest daughter, stopped breathing. 
She was just a small baby. And I remember just panicking. I froze and, and picked up her body that had stiffened and she was beginning to turn blue. And Liesl and I jumped into the car. That's all we could do is just race for the hospital. We didn't think about calling anyone. And, and every car we passed and every obstacle and every turn was just felt like an eternity as Liesl tried to clear her airways and we, we made our way to, to ICU. But for Jairus, if we look at verse 25, there's not just the delay now, there's a detour. His app is, says recalculating, recalculating. His agenda is recalculating. And, and look who comes onto the scene, verse 25. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Now Mark's account is beautiful because he intentionally captures the suspense of this moment. He inserts this in. He doesn't leave this account out, like let's just get on with Jairus. He puts it in here intentionally because there's actually an interplay between these two stories. And I was so disappointed. Sometimes the, the last thing I do after I've prepared a sermon is I, I go and listen to various sermons on podcasts. And most of the ones that I listen to is just like, yeah, we won't cover the woman that was bleeding. Let's just look at Jairus. And it's like, no, that's the whole point. She, she intrudes into the story as an interruption, as a delay. We're supposed to see this as one kind of story with different scenes. Because imagine how Jairus felt when Jesus stops to help a woman. To help this woman, who is she? She's not an influencer. She's been bleeding for 12 years and if Jairus knew about paramedics, he might have reported Jesus and said, you're not a very good paramedic. You don't know about triage. You don't know about uh, ranking people. I mean, my situation's code red. You need to send the ambulance straight to my house. My daughter's there. She has the ability to be saved. This woman's bleeding. I mean, 12 years. What's another few years? Just leave her alone. And perhaps this morning, you feel like Jairus. You've come here, and you know in your heart that you've cried out to God in prayer about something. Maybe it's some grief, it's some pain. And like Jairus, you feel, God, there's an interruption. Lord, why are you delaying? Why is your timing not my timing? Lord, what is going on here? Lord, do you care about me? Am I really a priority? Lord, you say I'm your child, but then why aren't you delivering? Maybe you even feel as you look out, Lord, you seem to be touching other people. Other people seem to be experiencing your mercy and grace, but about me? Lord, I'm somewhere down the road, the last thing on your mind, and here you are, blessing other people. Maybe even Jairus thought, you know what? He played the religious card. Lord, I'm even in church regularly. I'm a religious leader. I'm in the synagogue. Does that not count for something? Well, to Jairus' credit, we read nothing about what he was thinking or saying. To his credit, he's silent in this account. I'm just using my imagination to try and imagine what I'd be feeling like, but Jairus is silent. Because actually he's at the mercy of Christ's agenda. He has no say. He is the passenger and Christ is the driver and he has no say in Christ's agenda. So the question I have is what are we to make of interruptions in our lives? When God's timing isn't ours, when our plans change, our dreams get shattered, what happens when our flights are delayed? We've all been there. I know how I react I know what gets exposed when the sponge of my heart gets squeezed in those things. Then I see, ah, oh, Justin, you are more of a control freak than you think. Even Jesus models for us how to handle interruptions. Think about this. Jesus arrives on shore. He's obviously got a plan. Jairus interrupts Christ. And then it's as if Christ's interruption even gets interrupted by this woman. That's the, the beauty of, of looking at our Lord and saying, Lord, I want to be like you. Yes, there's an agenda. Yes, you're sovereign. Yes, you're in control. But, but Lord, your interruption even gets interrupted. That's the desire and the purpose and plan you had for people. You're always on mission. So what do you do when things are beyond your control and you are purely at the mercy of Jesus? Well, I love what a guy by the name of Trevon Wax wrote for the Gospel Coalition. Trevor, Trevon wrote, interruptions are not obstacles to our plan. There are opportunities for us to embrace God's plan. 
I found that challenging. Interruptions are not obstacles to our plan. They're opportunities. But God's saying, I want you to embrace my plan. You've got a choice here. C.S. Lewis once wrote in a letter to a friend, and I think I shared this beautiful quote that I, that I found as I was reading this letter last year. This is what he said to his friend. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life. That is profound. We think, oh, next week I'll have more time and then I can obey God and do what I need to do. Who are we kidding? It never gets easier. Your agenda that you think is now a little bit emptier next week than it was this week, what happens next week? It's like, oh, I'll just push it out by another week. It never happens. In the 1970s, if you told them there'd be email and there'd be Uber and there'd be all sorts of things that we enjoy, you'd say, oh, gee, I mean, we're just gonna be loafing around in the Bahamas. But you're busier and more stressed than you've ever been and we have all the tools at our disposal. It's a heart issue, how we deal with time and busyness and interruptions. That is one's real life. C.S. Lewis says, so better to find God today in the midst of real life than to wait to find him when things are supposedly better. Henry Nowen once wrote, it has been the interruptions to my everyday life that have most revealed to me the divine mystery of which I'm a part. All of these interruptions presented themselves as opportunities, invited me to look in a new way at my identity before God. Each interruption took something away from me and each interruption offered something new. So this woman, let's call her an interruption to Jairus' agenda, had been bleeding for 12 years. She'd had abnormal uterine bleeding and she spent all her money on doctors, the text tells us. If you want some humor, go and read Luke's account. He was a doctor and he kind of softens what she said about doctors a little bit. I like this, like I don't want people, I mean, I'm a doctor, she spent all her money and she's worse off. So he just softens that a little bit. But Mark's not a doctor, so he says, well, she spent all her money on doctors, she's tried everything, and in fact, uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, you see the doctors and sometimes you come away and you think, I'm actually worse off, worse off than before I saw the doctors. Apologies to all the doctors out there, I do love you. But not only does she know ongoing discomfort and pain? There's something deeper going on here. According to Old Testament law, she has been ceremonially unclean for 12 years. Imagine that. Everything she touches, the Old Testament says, becomes unclean. Everything she sits on becomes unclean. Anyone or anything she touches becomes unclean. Because blood was, was regarded as so holy and so precious and, 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 and there's all sorts of significance to blood, obviously, in the scriptures. And Jairus is a religious, woman, a religious leader. And here comes this woman. She suddenly discloses this. What did he think as a religious leader, knowing the law? He would have kind of felt even worse. This is a waste of our time. I mean, this woman has been making everything unclean. We stopped for her. She's been touching people. Maybe she even touched me as she pushed through. Who does she think she is? She's, she's turning this whole fiasco into an unclean mess. She's got no power. But what Jairus doesn't realize, she's as desperate as him. She, she, she also has no power. And death is the great leveler. Illness is. I don't think she was married. Perhaps this had started when she hit puberty. Imagine hitting puberty at age 12 and for the next 12 years till you're 24, until Jesus touches her, this condition. She would never have married. And even if she had got married, if this started after puberty, uh, her husband would have divorced her. Because he couldn't be intimate with her. She was unclean. She remained unclean. She was childless. She had no husband, no children, no family to support her. That's what's going on. It's not just some little symptom that we see. And I want to remind us, Rosebank, that everyone around us, in the crowd, in the crowd tomorrow in the traffic, in the crowd in the taxi, in the crowd as you walk between buildings in Santon, the crowd on your way to the airport, the crowd on the streets, there's people with a backstory. There's people with pain. There's people who, who, who just walk through life thinking no one will ever notice them. But I wanna say Christ does. And you might have slipped in this morning and, and you're part of this crowd and you think, I'll just be anonymous. I'm just the kind of person that slips in and slips out. But I'm just hoping that, that Christ can touch me in some way. And I wanna say he feels, he sees. You can't hide unnoticed. He knows that you need a touch from him this morning. And I believe her physical symptoms only pointed to a deeper emotional pain because she's a picture of us at a deeply spiritual level. She's us. 
We also have spent everything trying to find meaning in life before we found Christ. Sometimes all the things we've spent our money on has left us worse off than we were before if we had never gone down that road. She's like the prodigal son. She squandered all of her wealth to suck the meaning out of life and now she's lying flat on her back. She can only look up at God and she's come to her senses like the prodigal son because now she turns to Christ. She crawls through the crowd. She reaches out her hand and she says, if I could just touch him, I'll be healed. And she touches the end of a tassel of Jesus' garment. And in verse 30 we read, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? And then I think if we'd been there, look at what the disciples say. This is what they answer. You see the people crowding against you and yet you can ask, who touched me? Jesus, are you crazy? We're, we're being squashed. There's all sorts of people. It's like a herd of cattle. You're being shoved to and fro. There's this commotion. And now you want to ask, who touched you? And Jairus is saying, Lord, my daughter needs a touch. Well, what is going on? Is this guy of sound mind that he's asking who touched him? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Who touched me? Jesus knew. And then verse 33, then the woman knowing what had happened to her, because she experienced it inside her, she knew she was healed, she came and fell at his feet, she came out of the crowd, she, she knew that God had done something, she knew she couldn't keep quiet anymore, she knew she had to go public with her faith, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. It's such a beautiful picture of Jesus' touch, of Jesus' response to her. And here she is with her fear. What was she afraid of? Well, Jesus is this holy man. He's this rabbi. Is he going to shout at me? Is he going to rebuke me? Is he going to call me unclean? What's going to happen? The religious rulers now know what's happening. Are they going to just quarantine this whole area? Maybe she even thought to herself, what if I have made Jesus unclean? What if Jairus had the thought, now that the master is unclean, what if he's lost his power to heal my daughter because this woman touched him? Because it was often believed that if a, a healer became unclean, well, then they lost their healing power. But what does Jesus do? He issues no, rebu no rebuke to her. He calls her daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free. And this is the only woman we ever read about in the Gospels that Jesus ever addresses as daughter. The only one he calls daughter. Because I believe Jesus wants to create a connection with her. She doesn't have a family of her own. She doesn't have a husband, she doesn't have children. And so he wants to bring her back into community. He wants to adopt her into his family. He wants to, in some sense, remind her that, that she's dependent on him. She's his daughter and he loves her. Jesus restores people to wholeness, physically and emotionally and spiritually. I mean, it's not just her disease is gone. She can get married now. She can know intimacy with a man. She can have a family. She can have guests around. She can entertain them. She can hug. She can have support. And I think Jesus just in this beauty is, 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 is telling her, don't be afraid, go in peace. Jesus is saying, I acknowledge your act of faith, the simple faith. I'm not ashamed to be regarded as someone who's now unclean. I'm glad you touched me because I'm not unclean, because I'm the clean one who has transmuted my cleanness to you. But I think there's a link with Jairus here. Christ is looking at Jairus as he watches this delay, and I think Christ is saying, Jairus, this is my daughter. And I know your daughter's 12 years old, but I want you to see that my daughter, for 12 years has been in a sense spiritually dead. She's been cut off from community. She's been lost and alone for 12 years. And she's now mine, she's been adopted. I, I want you to see, Jairus, that I can bring spiritual life where life is gone. I can bring hope, I can bring joy, I can bring life. And yes, brothers and sisters, it's true. Her faith probably started out as superstitious. We know people who, if I could just be in the shadow of this healer, you know, if I could just put my hand on the TV screen when whoever is, is tele-evangelizing, you know, we see that superstition. But you know, God by his grace sometimes even takes our wrong motives. I mean, why are you at church this morning? Maybe as you think back, why did you become a Christian? Maybe it was a girl you fancied at the youth group. 
Maybe you came here because you had some need. God, in some sense, is not always concerned about the motives where we start from, but he leads this woman to genuine faith because her faith has actually come prior to her healing. It says that she'd heard about Christ and then came, and I love that, that's God's grace. I can't say I came with pure motives. Can you say that always? But God sanctifies it even in the process of worship and brings true faith out of that. It's not the amount of faith that matters, but the object of your faith. Don't believe those preachers who'll tell you, you don't have enough faith, just you know, work yourself up into a frenzy, get, get enough faith. It's not about how much faith you've got or how much faith you don't have. It's about the object of your faith. Is Christ the object of your faith? You can have strong faith in a weak branch and it can be fatal. You can say, rah, rah, branches are cool, branches, branches, and sit on a weak branch and you can fall to your death. Or you can have very small, very weak faith in a strong branch and you can sit there and it can hold you. Is Jesus the object of your faith? Because even small, little faith that even just takes a small step, reaches out, even just to touch the hem of his garment is honoring to Christ. Won't you come today and just reach out in simple faith and touch Christ in the midst of your pain? I think it's true to say that so many people crowd around Jesus, but so few really touch him. So many come into this auditorium Sunday by Sunday and there's rah, rah, but so few leave saying, I've really touched Christ and I've really met with him. And Mark now is about to switch the scene back to Jairus. And I like to think that Jairus was the first person in history to ever ride a roller coaster. Because I look into his face and this guy looks sick to, sick to his stomach because he's been going up and down in his emotions. His daughter is dying down. He races to Jesus. He manages to get through the crowd. Up he goes. Jesus is willing to come with him. He goes up even further. Then he's roadblocked and delayed and he's down in the dips. And then suddenly he sees Jesus' power. If he can heal this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, man, he still needs to come to my house. There is hope. And he's up again in the clouds on the roller coaster. But are you ready for the drop? The ride is about to take another drop in verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? And Jairus, like some of you in this congregation, have received the shocking news that no parent ever wants to hear. Your daughter is dead. And so many are unprepared for death. So many don't think about death. In some sense, who of us can really say we, we're prepared for news like this when it gets delivered to us? We're not. But we need to remember what John Blanchard insightfully says. Death is no respecter of time or place. It can strike at any moment of day or night, on land, on the sea, or in the air. It comes to the hospital bed, the busy road, the comfortable armchair, the sports field, and the office. There is not a single spot on the face of the planet where death is not able to strike. The whole world is a hospital, and every person in it is a terminal patient. You see, death is the end of human power. Think about all our smarts, all our technology, all our skills, all our strength. When death comes, that is the end of human power. That is what death is. It brings us to our knees and it says, you cannot go beyond this moment with all that you think you can. It is done. Hope is gone. But God. But God, because Jesus is God. And look at verse 36. Ignoring what they said. Jesus, ignoring what they said, told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Jairus, there is one and only one. Do you believe that I am who I say I am? Do you believe that I have power even over death? Trust me at the exact moment when faith is failing you, that's the exact moment that you must trust me. You're not bothering me, Jairus. I don't care what the critics say. I don't care what the scoffers say. I don't care what the voices of doubt that are trying to stop you and say, I don't bother the teacher anymore. True faith never gives up even when the end cannot be seen. Truth, true faith never gives up. You know, when little Louise Fowler was washed off the rocks at Betty's Bay, right in front of her parents and vanished under those swells forever, never to be found again, the funeral service, her dad, Ryan, and my friend, through his brokenness and through his tears, said this about his 
experience. And the Tudors were at the eight o'clock service. This is their granddaughter we're talking about, one of our elders. Shirley, who played violin, this is her niece. And Ryan, through sorrow and honest doubt, said this in a broken voice, and I asked him if he would share this with me after the funeral. He said, there are many giants of the Christian faith here today. Their faith is a solid rock. I am not one of them. My faith is layers of shifting sand and sediment, belief and doubt, skepticism and quiet contentment. The events of last week have stripped away everything. But a small pebble of faith has somehow not budged. And Isabel Tudor came at the end of the eight o'clock service, broken again, reliving it, and, and went back over December to this exact spot where her granddaughter was taken. It's not easy. We're not talking about just chin up, whistle while you work, don't worry, be happy. We're talking about deep realities. And, and my friend could say, yes, I don't see myself as someone strong in the faith, but who would in those moments? He said, but somehow, Somehow there's this rock of faith, this little pebble, even if it's a small pebble, even if I, I don't have strong faith, it has not been moved, it has not been dislodged, it has not been sent away. It's there. And Jesus journeys with us in our grief. And now he journeys with Jairus right into his home. Look at verse 37. He did not allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. So as Jesus arrives at Jairus' home, it's just filled with professional mourners. Uh, the other gospels tell us there were flute players, and these people are hired to kind of work up the crowd. That was the culture, you know, help us to grieve. And the minute, the moment Jesus says, the child's not dead, the child's asleep, so much for their deep grief. It just switched to laughter. The King James Version says they laughed him to scorn. They were laughing. Come on, man. We're professional mourners. We get paid to do this. Trust me, we know if somebody's dead or not. And you're telling us that this girl is just sleeping? Don't you think we would have checked? Don't you think her parents would have shaken her? They laughed at him, but Christ had a different perspective on death because he's not denying her death. That's not what's going on here. He's not coming with a second opinion and saying, guys, she's actually sleeping. You were gonna bury her alive and, 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 and she's actually just in a coma. You just didn't know that and I have a way to get out of the coma. That's not what Christ is doing. He's not denying her death. He's wanting to redefine it. Because death is redefined for a Christian as sleep. And just like you go to sleep every night and in some sense in a miniature way you reenact your own death, you go to sleep in the hope that you will wake up tomorrow, that you'll rise to a new day. You're always thinking about the day to come when you go to sleep. That's what death is for a true child of God. Jesus reinterprets it and said, death to me and death to God and death to you should be seen like sleep. For every son and daughter of God, death is merely like sleep. There's an expectation that you will rise again because he came to conquer death and this miracle demonstrates that. It's a foreshadowing of what will be true of every child of God. And did you notice something? Unlike our modern fake healers, Jesus didn't say, right, let's bring the crowds into the room, right, where's CNN, where's Sky News, let's get the guys in here, you know, let's bring in the media. He puts people out. He wants to diminish this miracle. He wants privacy. Yes, as he gets closer to the cross, one of the last things he does is more public when he raises Lazarus to life, and that's his countdown to the cross. Because, but, but for now, he wants just these few witnesses. He wants to not draw attention to himself. He wants to give us a picture. He didn't want people to look for a sensational earthly miracle, but rather to focus on what the miracle pointed to. Because this is something rare. This is not something he wants everyone to, to say, well, let's have a, a miracle a minute and won't you raise this one and raise that one. It's, Jesus is showing us something. And he had the sensitivity to take the closest disciples so that they can learn and be witnesses so we can have this account. And then he takes the girl's mom 
and her dad. So beautiful. He knows the importance of family at a time like this, and he says, Mom, Dad, won't you, won't you come in with me? Why? Because he knows they're the ones that are genuinely grieving and grieving the most. I mean, they've given birth to her, they've raised her, they've fed her, they've clothed her, they've, they've, they've danced with her, they've grieved with her, they've laughed with her, they've done life with her, even though she's only 12 years old. And now in this room, they're staring, mom and dad, at a lifeless body. And verse 41 tells us that he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kum, Talitha, kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. I mean, this is so beautiful. He takes this little girl by the hand. He reaches into the chasm of death. And that's what I love about Jesus. He's always crossing boundaries. He crosses the boundary into uncleanness with a bleeding woman. And now he's touching a dead corpse, which had even graver consequences in terms of Old Testament law. He's touching a corpse and he's reaching into the chasm of death. And he says two things to her in the Aramaic. And the Greek writers don't even know quite how to translate it, so they leave it in Aramaic and they just kind of put a, a Greek translation, which kind of is literally true, but it doesn't get to the heart of what Jesus was saying. The first thing he says to this little girl, she lies there as a corpse, is Talitha. Literally means little girl, but it doesn't get across the sense of the Aramaic. It's a term of endearment. Just like a a mother would say to her daughter, honey, or call her sweetie pie, or my precious, Jesus is using a term of endearment. In fact, the Aramaic word captures the idea of, of a little lamb. Jesus is saying, my little lamb, Little lamb, and he calls out to her in the same way that her mom would call out to her in the morning and just say, my little lamb, it's so beautiful, my precious. And the second thing Jesus says to her is not just Talita, but he says, come, come, which means wakey, wakey, it's time to get up, it's a brand new day, it's a morning, opening the curtains, have a look at this beautiful new horizon. Jesus is doing what this girl's mom or dad would have done on a brand new sunny morning. He takes her hand and says, honey, my little lamb, it's time to get up. It's time to wake up. And she does. Jesus is facing the most merciless enemy of the human race. And he just takes her hand and he brings her out back into life. Jesus is saying by his actions, if I have you by the hand, then death is only sleep. Nothing but sleep. I was moved by what Tim Keller writes. He says, there's nothing more frightening for a little child than to lose the hand of a parent in a crowd or in the dark. But that is nothing compared with Jesus' own loss. He lost his father's hand on the cross. He went into the tomb so we can be raised out of it. He lost hold of his father's hand so we could know that once he has us by the hand, he will never ever forsake us. What was the blessing in this girl's resurrection, her physical resurrection? Yes, she was restored to her family, but think about it, she's gonna die again, as was Lazarus. So is this really the greatest blessing? When we desire our loved ones to come back, or even in those moments of death, as we pleading, God, won't you raise this one to life? In some senses, our desire not for us, Because if they're a child of God, is is it not better by far to be with Christ actually from God's perspective and theirs? Yes, we need to be real in this, but but let's think about it that, that even a physical resurrection only has limited value until that person dies again. I believe this miracle is recorded to reveal that Jesus is who he says he is. This is to point to Christ, it's to magnify him that he's God with us and it's a miniature version of our own story of salvation and resurrection. Kate read it from Ephesians 2, we were spiritually dead. We couldn't lift a finger. We were separated from our Father, God, and Christ made us alive through his death and burial and resurrection. And we were powerless to do anything unless he calls out to us. And with just two words, Jesus didn't have to work up a show, he didn't have to get the organist to play an extra verse of whatever. He's just there and he just says, Talita kum, doesn't call on anyone else's name, doesn't have to pray to anyone else, he is God. And he restores her to life and then says, give her something to eat. She's not a vision, she's not a ghost. I know uh, she's real, she's, she's got her appetite for life back. Jesus interrupts death. 
Do you believe that? Is that the God that you serve? The God who interrupts death and spiritual death in some senses of far greater consequence than even physical death, that he can interrupt physical and spiritual death. J.C. Ryle, a great commentator, had this quote which I found so beautiful in its strangeness, but yet its power of magnifying Christ. And this is what he says. There is a limit to death's power, and then he calls death the king of terrors. The king of terrors is very strong, How many generations death has mowed down and swept into the dust? How many of the wise and strong and fair death has swallowed down and snatched away in their prime? How many victories he has won and how often he has written vanity of vanities on the pride of man? Patriarchs and kings and prophets and apostles have all in turn been obliged to yield to him. They have all died. But thanks be unto God, there is one stronger than death. There is one who said, O death, I'll be thy plague. O grave, I will be thy destruction. That one is the friend of sinners, Christ Jesus the Lord. He proved his power frequently when he came to earth the first time in the house of Jairus. He'll prove it to all the world when he comes again. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Is death. Its sting has been removed. Its fangs have been defanged. 2,000 years ago on Calvary, God the Father lost his only child his precious sweet son to death. And one day your earthly hand will let go of every single thing that you love and those that you hold most dear, every hand by death will be pried open and have to let go of even the dearest, most beautiful people that we have in our lives. But on that day, if Christ is holding your hand and if you put your faith and trust in Christ, in that moment he will take your hand and he will say to you, My little lamb, wakey, wakey, time to get up. And you will open your eyes and you will be welcomed into a brand new eternal day with dazzling sights that you've never seen and experiences that you've not yet enjoyed. The scriptures say, no mind has seen, no ear has conceived, no eye has conceived. That means think what you want, imagine it. It will be outstripped. And on that day you will recognize there's no pain or mourning or crying or suffering or death. It is gone. That is a chapter that is closed, that is long forgotten. So I must ask you, does Christ have you by the hand? Have you trusted his grace? Have you stared death in the face? And yes, it's still fearful in some ways, but are you hopeful? Do you know that death is not the end? Because if you're in Christ, then he is holding your hand. And all you have to do this morning is come like Jairus and this bleeding woman and fall down before Christ. Say, Lord, I need to touch you. Lord, I need cleansing from you. Lord, I need to invite you back to my home into the recesses of my soul. Lord, come everywhere and bring life where there is only death in my home in the hidden recesses of my heart. And do it, my friends, while you still have time, while there's still a beating heart of breath in your lungs. Because Jesus says to all of us, As he said to Mary and Martha when their brother died, John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, he said to Mary and Martha. Do you believe this?